So, welcome to our session. We're going to get started. It's 10.45 on the dot, so any uh, late stragglers will have to dance into their seats. Um, this, this, uh, this session is called An Introduction to Basic Algebra. So, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so, this is Time, Inc.'s big move to Drupal, which is a very compelling topic, of course. Um, if you know anything about Time, Inc., um, when I say big move to Drupal, I really do mean it's a really big move. These are all the different titles and brands um, that Time Inc. Uh, it consists of. So all of these brands are moving to Drupal, right? So over the next year, um, or, or sorry, since the, over the last year, uh, myself with AppNovation, PwC, and Time Inc. have been working together to develop a strategy to get all these brands onto Drupal in a, in a somewhat sane manner. So uh, we're here to talk to you about that today, uh, kind of talk about uh, various aspects of that uh, that process, starting with the background and and uh, into development and processes and all those things. I'll show you the agenda right away here. Um, but just to introduce the panel here, we have Matt Muratello, uh, who's the uh, Director of Internet Content Support at Time, Inc. We have Tanner Durham, uh, who's a technical consultant on the project. And uh, we have myself, Scott Bell, Senior Creative Lead at AppNovation Technologies, and Kevin Moll, Senior Developer. Appnovation as well. And we've come to you from various points on the globe here, or on the continent anyways, and meeting here in Austin, so it's pretty cool to talk about it. So the agenda we have for today is we're going to cover the history of uh, the digital CMSs at Time, Inc. We're going to talk about how and why Drupal was selected, um, talk about the creation of the DCMS playbook, which Matt will talk about. Uh, Tanner is going to go into some of the tools and processes uh, that you use throughout and uh, then myself and Kevin are going to tag team, and we're going we're to talk about the editorial user interface that we developed, um, why, things were dis you know, why things were designed a certain way, and how things were developed. So a little touching on uh, some development there. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to Matt. He can get started giving you some background. Thanks, Scott. Welcome, everyone. So. History of Digital CMS at Time Inc. So Time Inc. has been producing websites like most other media, large media companies and publishing companies since the mid-1990s. Um, and we have gone through a variety of platforms. Um, early on, we were early adopters of the Vignette platform and built a custom CMS editorial UI on that. Um, for those of you that are familiar with Vignette, we started off really, I believe, with Vignette version 4, but when we adopted version 5, it, it really stood around for a long time. Um, we did upgrade to version 6. Um, for those of you that are familiar, it's a Tickle-based um, application. allows you to create templates using Tickle. Um, but realized that, you know, when we got to the, you know, mid-2000s that um, we were limited by the platform. There were certain things that it just didn't do. Um, so at that time, decided to start building a homegrown CMS, uh, which we named TIPS. Um, and at the same time, actually, built a much nicer um, extended user interface on top of that that was um, based in Flex um, in this application called TIPS, which was very XSLT-based. Um, and really, actually, at that point, had Vignette version 6 and TIPS living side by side. There are certain things that TIPS does very well, and there are actually certain things that Vignette, um, even till this day, does very well. We actually still have some of our largest sites um, on Vignette, um, people in EW, um, and actually others, um, not to forget anyone. But um, as time went on during the 2000s, we, we started to get this even more complex mix of technologies because titles wanted to have the ease of a blogging platform um, and be able to just blog content out there as quickly as possible. So WordPress even came into the mix. So you would have a site um, you know, like people.com that would have subdomains that were actually pointing to WordPress. And that added an additional level of complexity. Um, even though it gave the editors the ability to quickly get content out there on their blog, um, the complexity came when you wanted to make all of these things, all of these sites, all of these technologies look like really one thing, people.com or ew.com or in style or cooking light. Um, and what you wound up having to do was there was some manual work that editors would have to do to go and take the content that they published in WordPress or somewhere else um, and tout it in the main platform, which was Vignette or Tips. So there we wound up in a, a complex environment, heterogeneous you know, mix of technologies. Um, required a lot of custom integrations. Um, 
in addition to CMS, I also manage our search technology. And making search pull together all of this content and really having that, I mean, that's the one place that you really have to make it all seem as if it's coming from one technology, one CMS. Um, a lot of custom integrations, a lot of feeds going back and forth. So how we selected Drupal as our digital CMS. So uh, about 18 months ago, um, PwC um, came in-house and worked <coughs> with us to review the CMS landscape, review all of the various CMS platforms that are currently out there, um, WordPress, um, Adobe CQ, um, Joomla even, I think was in the mix at one point, but of course Drupal as well. Um, since we already had in-house experience with Drupal 6 and 7, um, and since Drupal is such a modular, great platform to build upon, um, Drupal actually wound up becoming our choice. Um, and we decided to use Drupal as the core of a larger platform that we refer to as DCMS. Not a very exciting name, DCMS, but one that works for us, and it's really stuck at this point. Scott will actually touch upon that more <laughs> later. Um, but now that we've decided upon Drupal, we start to think about some of our larger enterprise requirements. Um, what were the things that we really needed to extend Drupal to do to meet our needs? So I have here active, active, active. Um, being able to have Drupal running actively in multiple data centers so that if there is some sort of a failure in one data center, we can easily shift over to another and really make sure that we don't skip a beat for our editors so that they can continue to publish our content and get it out there so that we could have a, a fast time to market was a very important thing. Two other things that, um, as we were working with PwC, came up as being important features of this new platform was the ability to embargo content um, and also contextual preview. And we came up with some interesting solutions for that um, using Drupal. So content embargo, you know, we have some sort of, you know, person of the year for time.com that, you know, we want, we, we're going to announce it on TV and we want to publish that bundle of content at the same time that somebody's announcing it. You know, we want to make sure that that stays within the confines of the CMS and isn't accidentally published beforehand. But along with that, we want to be able to preview it um, in its sort of natural form, um, be able to click off as you're linking or click on links as you're previewing pages to see exactly what users are going to experience once we publish this bundle of content. So we actually adopted a module that was created as a part of the LSD initiative, um, SPS, to do that. So that leads us to the playbook. We quickly realized that we needed to really define um, what the DCMS platform was going to be. We really had to work IT and the title management, the brands. Really, we had to partner together to come up with a shared vision. What did they want from a CMS? What did we want from a CMS? And really, we're all one thing, right? So, so what collectively did we need to build into this platform to make sure that it gives all of our brands who have a, a diverse collection of, of content or a diverse you know, variety of content that they publish? We have celebrity sites. Then we have something like My Recipes that publishes recipes. Um, how do we make sure that we build a platform that meets all needs? Um, so we decided to come up with a playbook, um, an implementation guide, something that described the technology stack, but also the <coughs> modules that you would use, contributed or custom, um, the platform, the search technology, and even went a little bit further. Um, during PwC's engagement, um, they reviewed all of our content types and actually found that we had something well over a thousand content types if you just looked at all of our various CMS platforms and, and the content types that each brand had spun up as they've evolved. So part of that effort was to rationalize those content types and try to really find out what's the, what's the essence of each one of those. And we came up with, you know, about a dozen um, content types that really are the base um, you can extend them, you can customize them to your needs. But we wanted to make sure that we had some sort of a standardized data, metadata schema um, that would allow us, it gives us a number of benefits. It gives us benefits when it comes to building modules and contributing 
code within the company and sharing from one brand to another, but it also allows us to do things like share content with other, other systems. Um, you know, if we know that our data structure is going to be, you know, a certain structure, a certain list of fields, and we know what the data types are associated with those fields, we could then have some external system interact with us and port data maybe back and forth. Um, so that's, it's an exciting new thing for us, and uh, we're actually already starting to reap the benefits, I believe. Once again, Kevin and Scott are going to touch on that a little bit later. Um, so we standardized content types. We also had a list of curated modules, um, created custom modules, and released that um, internally and had sites already build against it and launch. So it's a very exciting time. A lot of people in this room, actually, are from time just call out to that have had a part to do um, a part of this, you know, that we could have kind of done that without their help. So um, on that note, I'm actually going to hand off to Tanner Dorr. Um, Tanner and I, you know, we, we actually started working on this together and at the point that we completed the playbook said, you know what, it's time for us to actually start implementing this. So he's going to talk about how we did that. Hey, so as Matt was saying, I, I came onto the project around the time that they would kind of put this vision in place where they decided to use Drupal, they decided a lot of things about how they wanted to have a distribution, they wanted to have the titles uh, be able to extend that distribution, and uh, I, I do think it's worth pointing out here that, you know, I was really fortunate to work on this project and I was fortunate to work with Mark Zampetti and his engineering team on a lot of these tools and processes. I see. Seth Schneider's over there. He was a real key player in all of this. So, um, you know, it was one of the most talented and thoughtful engineering teams I've, I've had the pleasure to work with at, at time. So, like I was saying, the mission here was the, the title-specific development group. So the way things were organized when, when I showed up at time is that they had different groups. They might have a group of developers working on three or four brands, depending on how things were split up. So they had these, you know, teams that were kind of disparate, but they, you know, they all were working together as best they could, but they all had their own missions that they were taking on. And so part of the idea here was we, we had a Drupal Center of Excellence, you know, it's kind of a lofty title for our, our uh, centralized group there. And we were charged with taking this playbook and evolving it and working with the titles to, you know, make it make sense and to get um, standards in place that we could evolve and give the titles what they needed to be able to publish the software and the content that, that they were trying to get out the door. Um, so everything around this kind of process you'll see is, is the concept of a base distribution that can be extended by the individual titles as they need to extend things. So. The, the kind of first thing, this is like just a little kind of house cleaning thing, is, you know, uh, we had a jump box in place and, um, you know, I've seen other places do this, I think this works great, where instead of giving everybody access to all of the boxes, you give people access to a jump host and from there they can run um, drush commands using aliases out to any of the boxes, the dev or the QA or, or whichever boxes they happen to have access to. Um, and then something that uh, was done here that I haven't seen anybody else do is that because of the security concerns that they have at time where, you know, they have contractors like me and consultants and, you know, they have different um, levels of security and they're very thoughtful about the security process, um, you know, Drush is a really powerful tool if you give somebody full access to run, you know, any Drush command. Um, so they put a limited Drush in place called TI Drush for Time Inc. Drush. And uh, that, that way they could dole out kind of a, a subset of Drush um, easily to, you know, certain groups of people. Um, and so kind of getting into more of the nuts and bolts here of the build process and how this was set up, um, we were using Drush Make. And we would independently version control Drush Make from the rest of the of the files in the in the repositories and this is kind of another key strategy here that evolved was that we were going to have independent repos for independent uh, pieces of code like modules and whatnot so drush make had its own it would have its own repository 
and it would be uh, version controlled by the engineering team. So as updates, security updates, for example, came out for Drupal and they wanted to upgrade Drupal core, uh, that would be a release to this base Drush make file. And then the titles would maintain independently for their brands a Drush make file to add modules on to the base distribution. And uh, all of this was done. Everybody was adopting Gitflow, which is a really nice thing to see. Um, obviously, I don't have a lot of time to go into Gitflow here, but if you're not familiar with Gitflow, um, I highly encourage you to look into it. Uh, it's it's definitely can be a game changer when it comes to version control with Git. Um, but what, like I mentioned here before, we had independent repos, and by applying separate version control to each module. This gives the titles the ability to work better together, right? Because if uh, there's a custom module example for doing image management, Kevin and, and Scott are going to talk about some of the Im image management, custom image, man image management assets um, that are in place for this editorial tool. And uh, say Sports Illustrated, for example, wanted to evolve that for some specific need they had. Well, because that module is independently version controlled, instead of just version controlling the entire sites directory, for example, like you know we tend to do on a lot of Drupal projects, um, they're able to make a tag on this module kind of and take it to the next version without impacting anybody else. So they can update their Drush make file to point to this new version of this module that they created. And then because it's all in the same repo that everybody's referencing, everybody would have access to that tag. So they could start running builds against that tag, and then they could decide if that was a feature that they needed or didn't need. Um, so th that was kind of setting them up for, for the success here. Um, and the custom modules would be in a, an independent repo um, hosted at the, the Time, Inc. Uh, Git repository. Uh, but for contributed modules, we were using uh, Drupal.org. So if you, know, you were using a standard version of a, of a Drupal module, um, that was available on Drupal.org, then we would just point those make files to that. And so there's just Git flow for those of you if you're, uh, like I said, this is definitely worth looking into. Um, Jenkins is kind of where a lot of this stuff starts to tie together. So Jenkins would run on a utility server, and this puts the titles in a position to literally run a build with the push of a button. So if, remember, they have their Drush make file. Of, of all their modules that they've kind of added on top of the base distribution. So they're pointing to a specific tag of the base distribution. They have their own Drush make file where they've added modules to that, custom modules, contrib modules, whatever. And they push a button to run a build, and Jenkins will take a build, put it all together, and then you can, from that point, pump it out to a dev environment, QA environment, um, production environment, and you can run some other automated processes in the process. This is all open source, free stuff, and for bonus points with this kind of process, um, you can add Fing, which you could do all of this with uh, Jenkins, but Fing allows you to kind of abstract some of the complexity out of Jenkins and into Fing, where you just have uh, build files, where you have Simple XML documents where you can put your Drush commands and your Unix commands that need to run to automate the build into an XML file. And again, this was uh, enabled time to abstract um, the titles from the base distribution. So there's the base distribution uh, build XML file where there were certain things that would always run as part of every build. But then there was a different, uh, there was an add-on. A title could add things to that. So if the title wanted to um, add certain things to a build, certain specific type of cache clears or whatever, uh, they could do that through their custom build.xml file on top of the distribution. And the last piece to this puzzle is the master module. And um, I think this is like one of the most underutilized modules maybe. Um, they, it's, it's a really fantastic module. Nobody here contributed to the master module, did they? Nobody in this room? Well, if you ever, I'd be happy to buy anybody that contributed to this module of beer because this is a really good module. Um, and what this will allow you to do is um, this module, it gives you a way of configuring what modules should be on and off for your um, distribution. So, and as you do deployments with Jenkins, this is one of the things you can have it run, um, have the master module run, and it'll give you a report on 
what modules are installed, what module uh, according to your list. And you can do this by environment. So for example, if you want to have the views uh, UI turned on in uh, dev and QA, but off in production, you can configure all of that in your settings <coughs> file for the master module. You run drush commands, and the master module will go through, and it will, it will turn on and off whatever modules you have set for those environments in your settings.php file. Um, and we used include files, so we had a base file, and then again we had the titles where they could, you know, manage beyond the base with their own uh, master file, settings file that was included into settings.php. And this just works super slick. You even get reports in Jenkins of if you're, perhaps you have something, um, have a module that's missing, you have modules that are turned off, you have modules that are redundant. And you can even configure this to, um, say you have modules that you always want turned on that cannot be turned off. You can add those um, to, uh, to be always on. Like for example, at time we're using the LDAP module. So to sign in, you need that. So we could, we could actually configure that so that there's no way for a build to turn that off. Even accidentally, you couldn't, you couldn't turn that off. So uh, super powerful module for managing deployments. And if you have, to, if you have a situation where you have, um, you're using update hooks and stuff to manage builds, uh, I would encourage you to look at the master module. So here's just a little overview of the, the whole process here. So you've got the little developer in the girl in the corner here. She's making commits to Git. Um, she can go to Jenkins and push a button, say she's working on build 17. Jenkins will run a drush make and go out to drupal.org and all of the custom Git repositories and package up a build. And then once that's finished, you know, she might have a report, there might be an error, she can iterate on that. But then <clears throat> let's say that she gets a build that she likes she can push it out to development for testing and in that process run the master module so it'll turn on and off whatever modules you have configured. So you could have the devel module on in development, for example, and then when you go to QA, it would, it would be off. Um, and all of this is, you know, very automated, very push button, very, um, you know, just, it's all done through a web browser, right? So she's done everything from the command line with Git and through a web browser and all the way she can deploy all the way to production. So it's an excellent process. I, I really enjoyed working on it with these guys at time. Um, the next thing uh, we were going to talk about is the editorial user interface. And uh, Scott and uh, Kevin are going to lead that. Yeah. All right. So of course Tanner talked about all the different tools that they made for developers of the, of the platform, but there's a whole other side to this, and that is all the editorial staff that exist at Time. And there's, uh, there's a lot of them, because there's a lot of different titles, they're constantly creating content, and uh, you know, they need a way to, to you know, move on to Drupal from all, some of these legacy systems without being too freaked out about it. Um, so that was the idea. We wanted to uh, ease the transition of editorial staff onto Drupal. Um, you know, it can be intimidating in your day-to-day -day workflow, especially when you've been working on a certain platform for many years, to all of a sudden just make a switch and, uh, and author content within a totally different interface. Um, so some of the business goals for the editorial user interface were to, uh, for teams to be a lot more cross-functional. So if there's editorial staff on one title that needs to work on the other, there's a lot less training involved. Uh, they'll log in and they'll see a very familiar interface, so something very unified. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, overall, uh, on a lot of projects that I've worked on, uh, you know, you tend to neglect the Drupal admin interface uh, because most of it's, you know, consumer facing. So it was a really cool um, uh, project to work on where we got to focus primarily, completely actually, in the in the editorial user interface. So. I'm um, going to kind of talk about the processes of how we got to, uh, you know, some of the decisions we made on the editorial UI, and Kevin's going to chime in about how we developed some of those features. Um, so to get the ball rolling, we really needed to find some common ground amongst all the editors. So, like I said, we wanted the transition to be very easy. So we got some demos from the old, some of the older systems. Um, we found out what they liked about those previous assist, uh, previous systems, things they didn't really want to let go of. Um, as well as things that they did like, or sorry, didn't like. So, you know, like bottlenecks in their workflows. Um, you know, having to open up a new tab to do a totally different thing and taking you out of the authoring context. Those are things we wanted to really um, uh, resolve. And things like automation as well. Um, things that were, you know, traditionally manual that we could actually, you know, automate and save people a few seconds because time to market is really everything in, in this industry. Uh, so we identified various opportunities for improvements and this kind of, 
led to our development roadmap and how we prioritized the features that we were going to build into the editorial UI. So things like uh, cropping photos and, and the ability to even just preview an article even on a mobile device or anything like that, embedding rich media into articles, searching for content. These are all uh, the areas that we focused on throughout the development of the editorial UI. So to get the ball rolling, we created some wireframes. And, and you know, nothing too crazy here. I, I, I mean, I knew that Drupal has these forms, and so I basically put them into a wireframe. I'll show some examples. Um, and the idea was just to bring those to editorial staff to get the ball rolling. So um, content, we focused on the content creation workflow in, in the design phase, um, as it is the core day-to-day -day workflow that they work in. So um, again, one of the main things was maintaining authoring context. So when creating an article, keeping the user on the article creation page without having to navigate away from that page, um, but also while still needing the ability to add images to an article. And, and, and in DCMS, um, images are an entity type as well. So it's not like uploading a file. You have to actually have you know, all the metadata around that image. You have to create a note, right? So we wanted to find a way, a really easy way to keep the user in the authoring article uh, context and, uh, and, and creating images if they need to. Um, and also, you know, dealing with just you know, common sense type things like the logical ordering of form, of the form itself, the field grouping, um, you know, headlines are at the top, bodies in the middle kind of thing. We wanted to make it so, uh, you know, it's, it's very self-explanatory, but we wanted to make it so it's second nature for a, a, an author to create an article, see it, kind of see it in their head, you know, and kind of have a predictable result um, that what they were authoring on the screen was kind of going to, you know, reflect on the article and the same anatomy and everything. So... Um, that was really important. Um, so a little bit of information architecture um, phase was done there to de determine the right flow of the forms. Um, and also understanding that sometimes design decisions are subjective, especially when you're trying to, uh, you know, get consensus amongst a really big group of people. Some will like it one way, some will like it the other. So we identified certain areas where we could make configurable so there would be no fighting. All right, so... Once we created the wireframes, the conceptual wireframes, again, mostly just a shot in the dark, you know, here's something to get the ball rolling, get the discussion going. We brought them into workshops with all the editorial staff. Uh, so we needed to start somewhere, really. Um, so we brought these in, and we wanted these sessions to be really interactive, collaborative. We encouraged staff to give us ideas. We just wanted to show them, here's how you might create an article in DCMS, as opposed to in Vignette or in Tips. And, uh, and so we encouraged them to give us ideas. We, we definitely explained to them that no ideas were bad ideas. Um, but what we found was there was a common theme um, among a lot of the different groups, and that really helped us prioritize what features we needed to actually focus on in, in the first releases. Um, and, of course, most importantly, with having the editorial staff involved in this process, um, it's a good way to get them excited about moving on to DCMS, to get the buy-in that we need from the editorial staff so they're not too scared, and also to give them a sense of ownership and pride about the product and, and that things are moving in the right direction. So that was really important. Uh, we held various events um, at Time, Inc. to get, uh, to get the buy-in, uh, things like the town hall demo, which I'll show some pictures of here. We did an open house. We also did some really small branding on DCMS itself because DCMS is kind of a dry name, so we, uh, we kind of popped some color into it. So as you can see, a lot of people showed up to this event. <laughs> No, this is, uh, this is just rehearsal picture, but it's very similar to what we're doing here, only, you know, this was more of a, um, you know, it was a town hall demo. We did an actual product demo. I had my, my turtleneck on and everything, and uh, we walked through the entire, you know, workflow. It was a scripted demo. We showed some of the cool features that, that we wanted people to be excited about, and also, you know, the features that they brought to us, saying that, well, it would be really cool if we could do this, and now we show them that we actually built it, and they're seeing that their, you know, their suggestions are coming to life. Um, that was a really uh, good thing for, for that. Um, so a lot of editorial staff and management attended that. Um, we also did a, uh, a panel discussion at the beginning of that demo where we had various tech leads from uh, some of the different titles, uh, Josh sitting over here, um, to represent some of the other brands. And, and basically they, were, they wanted to give their input on how DCMS will help their brands um, move on to the next level. Um, so that's, that was the town hall demo. Um, a few months later, we did an open house. So this happened on a Friday uh, between the hours of 10 and 2 a.m. So we had a lot of people coming through here. And basically, it was a genius bar type setup. So you could walk in, and there's a lot of different uh, you know, genius bar stations with shiny Macs on it. You kind of felt like you were walking to an Apple store in a way. Um, everybody was wearing our DCMS shirts. And uh, you know, people would be, get ushered to a station, and they'd get a 10 to 15-minute 
kind of personalized demo of the platform. Um, and again, at this point, we had already added new features, and it was even more polished at this point. So uh, people became really excited about that, and, and a lot of positive feedback came out of that. Um, so that's all about you know socializing the, the platform and getting people excited. And lastly, we did just some really quick branding on DCMS. Uh, you know, how do you make DCMS a little more exciting? Well, you pop some color into it. And, uh, and, you know, that's the name that stuck. We actually tried to come up with some other names. Has stuck, yeah. Yeah. It's very popular. <laughs> yeah, but DCMS is the one that stuck. It kind of, you know, if you say it fast, it's really easy to say. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's, the, that's kind of the logo and the branding behind it. Um, so now we're going to talk about some of the features of DCMS. So, so the key features here we focused on are form navigation, entity referencing, image cropping, uh, editorial search, dashboard, and, of course, a mobile component to that as well. Um, so starting with the, uh, the, the form. So here's an example of the wireframe that I, I provided for the editorial staff. And uh, like I said, it's a very overlooked aspect of, of developing a site. Um, now, a lot of different content types, especially like recipes, and you know, the more they add on to a content type, the longer they can get. And that was one of the pain points, is that navigating these really long forms can be really cumbersome. You know, it adds literally some seconds to your workflow, which is, which is a lot when it adds up. So uh, long forms that require a lot of scrolling or clicking, we developed this form navigation, which you can see along the left-hand side. Now, this is uh, it's very basic. We just use field groups. So in the field UI, um, we set up the content type features to be field group, basically, in a very logical order. Um, and then we just you know, pre-process the node forms, output this, uh, the field groups as a jump menu. And when you click on one of the jump links, it will just scroll the page for you directly to the section. This is really, really helpful when you need to edit something, especially something that's already filled out that has a lot of images, like a gallery. You just want to jump right to the images section. You don't have to scroll. You don't have to open up collapsed field sets. A um, lot less clicking and just, you know, and it's helpful for developers too as we're testing and trying to add dummy content. We, we, we use this a lot and the developers even really liked it. So that's how I knew it was going to be good. And, and of course, we have a, a mock-up too. So we added some paint to these things as well. So this is sort of a glimpse of what DCMS looks like. It's very clean and concise. It's not really, you know, not a lot of eye candy here. It's supposed to just kind of stay out of your way. Um, but, uh, you know, we have the ability to, the form navigation here is on the top, right? So that was one of those things that was configurable because some people wanted it on the left, some people wanted it on the top. So the next feature we're going to talk about is entity referencing. This is obviously a huge, huge um, focus for us a really big feature and a really cool feature. So ultimately, um, like I mentioned a few times, the goal is to maintain authoring context. So by default, um, referencing in Drupal, entity referencing in Drupal is set to an autocomplete. So you can imagine that if you need to add an image to an article and you're needing to browse a really large library, like Time has a ton of images, uh, and you need to find that one image that you're going to attach, um, you know, an autocomplete field isn't going to help you. So we needed to find a better user experience and user interface for getting to the image that you need. Um, so again, we provided this wireframe, and very simple, right? Very simple wireframe. Put this in front of the editors and say, okay, how do you want to find content? How do you want to find the images? What kind of things do you search for? Um, so using this um, approach, we were actually able to get, okay, well, we know the editors want to filter by certain things, we, so we added the filters on the left, right? We knew they wanted to have either a grid view or a list view, so we added the toggles to toggle between back and forth. So here's the sort of a visual representation of what that ended up looking like. Um, so, of course, if an image doesn't exist in the system, they need a way to create that entity really quickly without leaving that page. So we gave them a drag and drop. You drag images onto this hotspot. You click Save. It automatically creates nodes, references them for you. You're good to go. You continue authoring your article. So Kevin's going to talk a bit about the implementation of that right now. So the overall goal for this whole thing was to make it easy, clean, but most importantly fast for content creators to create content. Um, and for most all of the titles at time, this means adding images. So in Drupal terms, that means referencing entities. So um, because it could get overwhelming with the amount of images that are going to be added to, to these these sites over time, we realized right away the autocomplete wasn't going to work for us, um, especially for content types like galleries where you're adding 30 or 40 images at a time to a single node. So having to go through and trying to remember even a slight bit of the title in order to find it in the entity reference search, I mean, I'm sorry, the autocomplete, and then do one at a time for 30 images, we, we knew right away that this wasn't going to work. So. Uh, 
We looked at Contrib. Uh, there was a couple modules that we looked at. Uh, Entity Connect was one. It's a great module, but it still didn't quite get us to our goals of making it clean and fast. So we developed a solution that was using c tool modals so that we could keep the user in the context of creating that particular node. Uh, we used views with the exposed filters to give that faceted search so they can easily find uh, the image they needed based upon any number of features or attributes to the image. Uh, and then we leveraged Form API's AJAX capability so that we would actually reference the images as soon as the modal closed. Um, so this was a way that we that gave the content creators a very powerful way to, to find all the images they need and easily connect them uh, to the node. So after we implemented this, we actually realized that we could use this for not only images, but really enti any entity type. So um, we configured it to be kind of smart. So uh, it would read the field settings for the field, uh, and if it was only a single value field, it would only allow you to reference a single value. Uh, if it was a multi-value field, it would allow you to enter as many images as that field would allow. Um, it would also read the allowable types, so if you wanted to allow, say, text documents or images, uh, then both of those content types would show up in the view so that you could attach or embed anything or any type of entity. So uh, it was a really powerful way, and it allowed us to achieve all of our goals of making a fast and easy way for editors to reference content. Obviously, I mean, we have, we're limited in time, so there's so much more that we could talk about on that, just that feature alone, but if, it, if you want to ask questions later on, we can, we can definitely answer more on that one. The next one is image cropping and editing. So just a quick point here. I mean, editors need the ability to crop different images or images differently for each individual image style and apply effects. So, you know, when we were doing our workshops and doing our one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, obviously Photoshop is used. I mean, you're not going to really replace Photoshop, but for some of the smaller titles, you know, they wanted to just have a quick way to sharpen something and change the crop on the homepage tout or in the article detail page. Um, so what we have here is the image cropping interface. So once you do select that image that you want to um, attach to the article through your entity reference, you click a crop link, and now you open up, you open up this interface. So along the left-hand side there, those are all the image styles that are being pulled in um, that, that are set to have the effect TI image crop on them. So now you're, they're available. Um, across the top, you have all the effects, and you literally just go one by one, click, change your crop, click, change your crop, add an effect, click, change your crop. Super easy. Click save, and then you just go right back into your authoring experience. So really quick way to do it, and uh, actually really cool, uh, really cool discovery that we made along the way of building this that, that Kevin will talk about right now. Yeah, this was a really fun feature to implement. Uh, when we came up those, with a solution for this, we knew we needed to create an image effect that could be applied to core image styles. Um, but we weren't quite sure how we were going to approach the UI. We, needed, we knew we needed a place where all of the image styles for the particular image would be on one page, and editors didn't have to jump back and forth and go to different tabs or move around. It, it all needed to be right there. So uh, we figured that in order to do that, it was probably going to take us even up to a few weeks to define uh, that, that interface. Um, but as, as we mentioned, we were building this system so that all these titles can collaborate. They can share code. They can share features. Uh, and during this, we found out that Sports Illustrator was actually developing this feature. So we were given a quick demo, and kind of light bulbs went off in our head. We all looked at each other and said, not only is this exactly what we want. It's better than we could have ever imagined, and it was all done. Uh, they designed that in such a great way that I almost had to touch nothing in the, in the front end UI code, and all I had to do was slightly adjust the way that it worked on the back end to fit into our workflow. So right then and there, we saved weeks of development. I think that was the first time that everyone actually saw the, that you know, this whole project, everything we're trying to do is actually happening already. So uh, that was a really fun way. And um, so that interface was really clean. It uses JCrop to, to manually select a, the image that you need to, or the part of the image that you want to display for that image style. And we also enabled a live preview. So you can actually see and adjust it and see how that's going to that's gonna come out. 
Yeah, that was a really defining moment along the project. I think I, I, don't know, I got a little bit emotional because I remember look, you know, looking around the room at all the different developers and being like, "This is it. This is what we. This is what we're striving for. We're building a community within time, and it's going to benefit everybody." So that was a pretty cool moment. And I think going forward now, they have a lot of different community meetings that they, uh, they, you know, they they plan to do this more often. So that was very cool. I didn't cry or anything. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the next feature is editorial search. So you're all familiar most likely with the admin slash content page. Now, it doesn't really give you a whole lot out of the box. It gives you a way to you know, find a piece of content, um, you know, but it doesn't give you a way to search you know, in a multifaceted way. So here's a wireframe of, of how we wanted to do that. Again, this is something we put in front of the uh, editors. We said, okay, how do you want to find content? What are some of the filters you need on the left? How do you want to find it? What do you, and when you find that piece of content, what do you want to do with it? So um, basically, Across the top, you have the different content types. Along the left, you have different um, you know, attributes of that piece of content as well. So you could, you could just basically say, I want articles, images, and galleries that are published within the last three days. Click, and you have a list of them, right? And then you want to subtract galleries from that. Click, it's gone, right? So you just keep, you know, it's an additive and subtractive search. It's a really quick way to get to the piece of content that you're looking for. And then once you're there, you can do anything you want to. You can publish it. You can edit it, of course. You can do bulk operations on it, things like that. Um, there's some really cool things under the under the hood on this thing, so uh, so Kevin will mention those things. So the main goal here was to keep the public facing site search separate from the back end editorial search. Um, this did two things for us. This allowed us to put content in the editorial index that wasn't that was either unpublished or not meant to be public facing. Um, this also prevented us from having to put a status equals published on every search results page there uh, because as infallible as all of our developers are, uh, we all know that that can easily get left off uh, by accident and all of a sudden you're exposing content that's not supposed to be seen by the public. And uh, so we kind of removed that from uh, being a possibility. Uh, the second part of that is also performance too. Uh, we didn't want anything to inhibit the editors while they were trying to search for content. So uh, if there was some heavy traffic to the site and a lot of people searching and hitting the index, we didn't want that to slow down the editor's process of creating content. Um, so uh, to implement this, we chose uh, to use the search API module with an Apache Solar backend. Uh, we felt that this gave us a better views integration uh, and with uh, exposed filters and bulk operations, it allowed us to create an interface that, that closely resembled the mock-ups that Scott had created and uh, that the editors were expecting. All right, so the dashboard. Uh, the dashboard was actually one of the most, probably the most requested feature um, that, you know, from the editorial staff themselves. Um, it was, um, you know, as different groups, during my interviews with them, what is the first thing that you want to see when you log into DCMS? And, uh, you know, of course, since there's so many different editors and different roles, we got a lot of different answers, actually. Um, you know, if you're a senior editor, you wanted to see an approval queue. If you were a, a contributor, you wanted to see your content and what status it was in, right? Um, if you were a site administrator, you might want to see some analytics data or some reporting. So, um, you know, and some people might want to see social media. So, of course, we had to kind of you know, think about that from a, from a holistic standpoint, figure out what's the best way to implement a dashboard. Um, so we created a wireframe again and, and just put some example widgets on there and, and held the workshops and, and just got people to put sticky notes. We gave them a blank piece of paper and said, here, create your dashboard. Write down the widgets that you want on it. And, uh, and then we took some of those widgets and we created them, um, things that were, uh, that, that were, again, repeated, you know, things that we saw that were a common theme amongst all the editors. Um, so here's an example of the mock-up. Uh, sorry. Actually, it was already there. Uh, the mock-up here. So again, just a colorful thing. It's you know, it's drag and droppable. It's customizable. It's kind of your you know, it makes you feel right at home when you log in at work and you set your dashboard up a certain way. You log in at home, it's still the same way. Um, you know, something so simple like that, it, it goes a long way with the user experience. Um, having things right where you left. It's like getting rid of your roommate that you don't like, right? So. Um, some really cool things about the about the dashboard too. That, uh, that that the way we built it that Kevin will touch on right now. So to implement this, we use the Homebox module. Uh, that's a module that allows you to have a per user configuration 
um, and allows you to order and resize blocks um, to kind of build your own little personal dashboard page. Um, one of our goals for this, though, was to create this in a platform agnostic way. Uh, we didn't want people uh, having to be Drupal developers in order to create these widgets. Um, so we came up with a solution that uh, allowed developers to create a widget with pure HTML and JavaScript, uh, drop it in a certain directory, and we would pick that up from that directory, wrap it in a Drupal block, and make it available to be put on the page. Um, so that was a pretty powerful thing there that um, allowed anybody with any knowledge of HTML and JavaScript to create a widget. Um, so most of these widgets would integrate with third-party services, so like Facebook and Twitter. Um, but we also, we also created widgets that would integrate with services through APIs. And again, uh, the goal was not to necessarily need to put a Drupal block there, but to put some HTML and JavaScript that would integrate with the service to get the, the content that you needed to display for the widget. So, for instance, uh, they had a content status widget where it would show you which state the content you have created was in, um, how many articles, things of that sort. Um, but in the end, if they needed to throw a Drupal block in there, they have that ability as well. One last thing on that, too, is that, you know, it gives you the ability to use any sort of front-end templating language that you want as well. We built some of the widgets using handlebars. Uh, we used, did one using underscore. So it gives you a lot of freedom there to, to create these little apps within your dashboard in, in any way you want. So a very powerful thing. So the last thing that we're going to talk about real quickly is, is mobile. So in the words of time, this actually revolutionizes how time publishes content today. Uh, they can create content directly from various events with your mobile phone. They can take a photo at the Super Bowl, and they can create an article right away. Uh, they can publish it right then and there, or they can assign it to somebody who they know is working at their desk, or they can save it as a draft and pick it up later when they get home. So, uh, you know, I mean, we take it for granted nowadays, but this is something that's really, really big, and, and the time to market is everything thing, you know, really rings true with, with mobile. So um, it's a scaled-back interface. It doesn't give you all of the stuff that you need, but it gives you, you know, enough to get going, right? So here's the wireframe of, of the, uh, the mobile in, in interface. And when you log in, you basically um, you, you land on your little scaled-back dashboard. It's basically a view of all your content. Now, the great thing about the mobile device as well, this is a mock-up of it, um, is that if you're out at a bar with your friends and you're having a drink and your boss calls you and he said, you need to come into the office and edit this article really quickly because there's a really bad spelling mistake in there. You know, in the past, you'd have to go into the office, but now you can just, you don't have to put your drink down. You just have to log in on one hand, have your drink in the other, and you just make that change. And uh, it's, so that's a huge win. Editors love that. So, uh, yeah, basically, node forms are optimized. Uh, this is basically just a sub-theme of, of the main theme that we used, uh, and that's all. It uses user agent detection, um, device atlas, to uh, determine what device you're on and feed you that theme. Um, basically, I mean... This note forms are a little bit scaled back because you don't always want to create an entire article. Maybe you want to create a stub article or a draft or whatever it may be. Um, but this is where we utilize some field, uh, collapsible field sets. So you can, you know, if you want to start a headline, just open up the headline, you know, create it, and, and move on. Uh, so very powerful, very cool. Um, a lot of wow factor when we're, when, you know, doing demos and taking photos of people and creating articles on the live website. Um, it, it went over very well with the editorial staff. Just one thing, and, yeah. and you can follow the content creation process from beginning to end, all on your mobile device. Mm -hmm. Take a picture, create an article, and publish it out there without having to touch a desktop. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, since we're, we want to be very cross-platform and, and mobile, we also, we're also developing the milk carton version, so you can actually update your website while you're eating your cereal. <laughs> so that's being released in, the, in v, V9 or something. So. Um, 11. V11. <laughs> So thank you very much. It's a very, you know, lot of, lot of content to pack into an hour session, so we wanted to save time for questions. Um, we know we went very fast, so um, open up the floor to questions now. And uh, thanks again. Yeah, if you just want to use the mic here, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Have you been able to contribute any of the modules you did, the gallery, the... Yeah, so actually, um, so that is something that we've given thought to and something that we're working on, you know, being timing. Um, there are a 
approvals that we need to get and, and to make sure that we're doing things in the right way. Um, so we're working on it. It's the best answer I can give you. Hi, I just wanted to say hi. Um, this is a very funny thing for me. I, and back in 1995, I was one of the um, Time Inc. digital. It was called Time Inc. New Media back then. Um, so when you speak of the history of CMS, actually we did Vignette 1 um, way back. Um, that replaced flat HTML. Um, so this all comes full circle for me. I just wanted to say it looks great. Um, it's so good to see you using Drupal. And um, it looks to me like you're, you finally got it right. Thanks. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I, I really appreciate what you were showing about uh, how to add media attachments to a node. I'm curious if you've done work with allowing them the flexibility to add that into body copy. And, and if so, what approach you took um, in, in handling that? Yeah, I mean, the answer there is we haven't ended, put it into body copy yet. Uh, that is on the roadmap, though, right? Yeah, basically that's the best answer we can give you. Yeah. One thing we have done, though, is we've worked on um, extracting, when possible, information from the actual image asset or, or video asset, if possible, like EXIF or IPTC, um, and allowing editors to take an image, drag and drop it into DCMS, and if that information is there, map it to fields mm -hmm. so that the node is actually created as a part of just uploading the image. Right. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for sharing all of this. I think it was great. I have actually two questions. One is of the operational nature, is basically how many people and how much time did it take you to build all of this? And the second question that I have is, did you guys have any concerns about allowing uh, uh, pretty much arbitrary HTML widgets into Drupal to pick them up? And what was the technical concerns and considerations there? Sure. So, um, so it takes a lot of people, actually, to do this. And it has many of the people here. I, I can't thank them enough. They you know, um, have been there you know, from the beginning. Um, you know, I have a team, actually, I had individuals from App Innovation. Tanner was working with me. Jeremy, sitting um, in the audience, he runs one of the development teams. So really a very large group and really a lot of collaboration between us and the brands. So, um, And I, this process, we really started 18 months ago, I would say. Um, so you know, it took a while for us, but we really wanted to think it out. And when I was talking about the playbook, that's what that was, defining how we do this. Um, as far as widgets, you're talking about whether or not, like, how do we go about accepting a widget or allowing people to Correct. It? Like, I mean, so, what, were, what is the process like in general, and what are the concerns, considerations, like limitations of the process? Uh, a little bit more in-depth about that, if you sure. can, please. Yeah. Sorry. So um, for widgets, um, we tried to make the dashboard as lightweight as possible. And like we said, we wanted to make sure that people could develop widgets with just having a knowledge of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, there, I mean, it depends, really, is the best way I could answer that, in that, you know, for a particular brand, if they have a, an integration with a third party, or even internal, you know, one thing we didn't mention is that we do have internal enterprise services that we want to integrate with as well. Um, if there's a specific concern for a brand, at least it gives them the freedom to go and develop a widget. So it really is based upon a need basis. If a brand has a need to integrate with a particular platform, they can. No, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's their development teams. When I say the brands, there's there's developers that actually work for Okay, so it's not exposed to like producers or anything like that. It's basically the developers who do that. Yes. Right, thank you. And just to go back to your, your first part of the question, I can tell you that the editorial user interface aspect and the development of that was a team of uh, about three of us, a developer, two developers and a themer over, the, over about seven months. And of course, I mean, Matt's team had a lot of stuff going on too, but the actual theming and, and the development of those features that I was, show, I was showing earlier, it was, it was a team of three people. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Do you guys have to translate any of your content? Do we have to translate our content? Right, is there a multilingual component to the content that people are putting on Times? Sure. I mean, it, if we talk about a title like People in Espanol, that actually is 
is in Spanish natively and translates. You have translation in place for English, I believe, as well. Bilingual. Okay, so, um, what, is, what is that process like for you guys? Do you have people on staff like manually creating them, or using something like LingoTech, or do you have do you outsource the translations to other firms? We don't have any specific process in place to do translation that I'm aware of, but you know, it's something actually that is a little bit beyond my um, scope. So that's really something actually that the brands would wind up handling on a title by title basis. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Two questions. Uh, first, what did you guys do to accommodate the content approval process? I would assume that there's different level of approvals within the organization from creating a piece of content to when it goes out to the public. Yeah, so we, uh, we use Stateflow. Uh, and we've uh, basically built in a, a basic workflow that's basic, you know, draft approved, uh, draft in review approved publish. Uh, and that, that workflow can be applied to any content type or not, right? So some, some content types won't have that enabled, um, but we do use state flow for that. So, sorry, what was the? State flow. State flow, okay. Uh, the second question is what type of user tests you, you guys have done um, to tailor the front end to your target audience? So the reason why I ask is when I go on the sites, I notice that at that navigation, that burger bar, and it says menu. So it, did you find out that people didn't understand that that triggers the menu? Or on the, on the mobile view, the, the red bar on the left also says tap as well. So mm -hmm. I think that's like, uh, you know, uh, have, you guys, have you guys done any type of user test to find that, you know, mm -hmm. having those actions to, to call the action to spell out is actually more beneficial to your target audience? We haven't done anything like A-B testing or anything like that on design assets. Um, what we do is, you know, that's that was the purpose of a lot of the demos that we had and a lot of the workshops that we held. Um, and also, we're in early release stages right now, so we're getting that feedback in real time, basically, uh, and, and we plan on it. But yeah, those are some, those are some you know, design patterns that you described that are, you know, Ask different people; they'll give you some different answers on what works best. Okay. Um, but we find that just you know a little bit of training is is all it really takes, and 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 they're good to go on those ones. So. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Hi. Uh, first and foremost, um, very impressive stuff. Um, and I, my question is more not I wouldn't be as technical as as the rest, but I'm talk. You explained the, the buy-in uh, for for brands and editorial and what you went through to. Um, um, kind of demo what you've d been doing. Did you did you run into any difficulties at first, or did you jump right to workshops and everybody was like, "Oh, this is great." <laughs> um, yeah, well, in my from my perspective, yeah, there was there was some difficulty for sure because um, you know when we're when we're s giving them such a simplistic view of how to create an article. Um, there was a lot of concern over, well, I'm not going to be able to do this anymore, or uh, how am I even going to do that? I don't see where that happens, right? So, um, again, it, it kind of goes back to educating them along the way and, and explaining that it's somewhat a fundamental, uh, fundamentally a different way to approach authoring a, a website. Um, so just by being really collaborative and open with them um, was one way to, to get over that. And then, uh, Matt, do you have any examples of, of things that were difficult? Uh, I, well, I <laughs> Yeah. So I would say that, you know, there were difficulties given the diversity of the brands that we're working with. Um, they're trying to achieve different things with their sites. Mm -hmm. So making sure that we're listening, um, making sure that we're hearing their requirements was just a, a big step. It was a big requirement for us to make sure that we were uh, getting their information. Um, you know, it was... Anything that is, you know, really worth doing, you know, is going to have some challenge associated with it, and it was a challenge. Okay. Thank you. Yes, you're showing uh, image management. How about video management? Anything that uh, plugs into uh, yeah, Kevin. what you're doing there? Yeah, we, uh, we use Brightcove um, for most of our video serving. So we didn't really get into that feature for this presentation, but we did put a lot of effort and work, and I believe that's still going on now to um, have a, a fully clean integration with Brightcove. That way, um, editors and content creators are purely within the interface of Drupal. Um, Brightcove is almost abstracted um, from that process, but yet we can still leverage them to serve the videos and all of the content. So um, we did quite a bit of work on that. We just 
in the hour time we have here, we weren't able to touch on it. Okay. So it would be something that you would, uh, taking the assets and the metadata from your Bright Cove and being able to connect it in and related videos and presenting yeah, well, it as I, a, The metadata and all of that information is put into Drupal. And uh, we actually use their um, batch processing system okay. to to throw the assets along with that metadata, and it gets ingested into Bright Cove. Oh, wonderful. And we actually utilize the entity search user interface that we were showing for mm -hmm. image entities for finding those videos. Excellent. Thank you. See if this works. Hi. Uh, in the presentation, you mentioned you guys were use, uh, doing like active, active, active states. Um, is there any specific like uh, at the database level, the uh, replication or clustering technology that you guys were using? We do have a clustering technology, and and even though I mentioned active, active, active to just demonstrate some of the more challenging requirements that we had, um, you know, it's something that we're actually still working on. I can't say that we've achieved it. Um, you know, we've taken a different path since the PwC engagement, um, still on our roadmap, still something that we uh, we think about. But yes, we do have clustering at the database level. Um, we're currently active standby um, and working on an active, active approach. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hi. I've got a couple of questions. So when you're writing the the business case for this program, did you have an expected savings you would make by having one coherent platform? Um, so, yes, <laughs> I would say. I, I don't have any, I can't quantify that for you. Um, but yes, I think just the idea that we would have a common platform across the company that you could share technical resources, you could share at many different levels, including um, the, the technologists, the actual developers that are working on these sites. Um, having that, I think there's savings there. There's savings in being able to reuse, um, being able to have one brand create tech, uh, functionality and then have another brand leverage it. I mean, we saved money and time with the photocropping tool that we described earlier that, you know, Sports Illustrated was working on creating their photocropping tool. They were following the playbook, and that standardization really paid off for us. It sounds like you really want to do portfolio management as opposed to project management. Trying, <laughs> I guess, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you didn't talk very much about migration or uh, complex integration with external systems. Is that all still to do or? Um, so I would say, though, that like Bright Cove is a, a, an example of a customization with an external system in that we have what we tried to do there was, I mean, there were really multiple things we were trying to achieve, but one of them was to make the user interface experience um, performant, make it um, responsive. So we didn't want somebody who's going to upload a three gigabyte video file to have to sit there and wait for you know the shipping and round trip to Brycove and then back again. So we decoupled that. So I mean that's the approach that we take. And there's any number of custom integrations that I wasn't able to get into as a part. Tanner has a couple maybe that you can sure. Touch on. Yeah, I mean there was an LDAP integration, there was a Ping identity integration for single sign-on with Acquia. So there were a lot of. Um, you know, third party and local kind of within the enterprise integrations. They had an API for doing customer subscriptions. Uh, there's an integration there. So there was a lot of integrations, um, you know, across the enterprise and with third parties as well. Yeah, actually, I mean, for our internal platform, I mean, alongside, alongside our editorial user interface, there are platform features that we've developed and Many of them are actually custom integrations with our enterprise services for polling, profiles, bookmarking, things we yeah. already had in place that now we wanted to hook into DCMS. Thanks. Fantastic. How accessible is your uh, the whole site, both on the <coughs> excuse me, both on the front end and in the uh, UI for the editors? Accessibility. Yes. Oh, um, well, there's some there's some cool features in place. I mean. It's not. It's not. Some, it wasn't our main focus, um, but there are some cool things like uh, you know keyboard shortcuts in place. Um, but uh, I think that's probably the extent of ac accessibility. I mean, it's not really a public-facing site, so we kind of knew our target audience. It's a smaller group. Um, we knew kind of their demographics and how they how they like to work. So. What about in the public-facing end? Are you guys required to be accessible or not? Well, that's a, it's a difficult question for me to answer. I mean, so I work for the technology group for IT, we 
create the platform, and then we hand off to the brand. So once again, I'm going to have to say that really that's probably more of a brand-specific answer, um, not not one I could probably really give you an adequate answer to here. Sorry. Okay. Do you have fe- – oh. Just for the record, and I don't know if you guys are aware of it, Honor and Jerry Beans, they didn't hire us to create the first launch Thank you. Thank you. Is that it for our questions? Any more? Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys.